right, you've all been screaming that you don't want to talk about baldness or greyness or the Melbourne Cup. You want to get into some serious stuff, and we've got some serious stuff coming. I am really happy to be joined uh, in the studio now um, by, I think, one of the champions of free speech around the world, actually. His name is Nigel Bigger, CBE, Commander British Empire. Is that right? Uh, That's the one, Sean. All right. Uh, <laughs> and he is the founder and leader of the Free Speech Union in Britain, which... If it's anything like the Free Speech Union here is doing, and I use the term advisedly, God's work in the space of <laughs> allowing people to express opinions in what is an increasingly polarised and intolerant uh, world where the very idea of being able to say what you think has been under attack for quite some time. Nigel, uh, I, I first want to ask you, you are uh, you've <laughs> amazing CV. You're an academic intellectual and a man of the cloth, right? That's right. A and an author. That's right. All right. Um, why free speech? Why has that become your thing now? Because, uh, Sean, I, uh, suffered that I suffered an attempt to, to stop me talking about seven years ago um, in, in my university. Um, I'd launched but not just any university. We're talking Oxford, aren't we? We're talking Oxford. Yep, we are. Um, I launched a project called Ethics and Empire in 2017, uh, which doesn't assume that empire is always uh, illegitimate. And uh, that provoked uh, uh, someone in, in, in Cambridge University called Priyambada Gopal to tweet all her mates in, in Oxford um, and to call them to arms with the immortal tweet, OMG, oh my God, this is serious shit. We need to block capitals, shut this down. Uh, all so right. That, that launched a campaign and I survived it, but there was an attempt to, to shut so me up. So cancel culture came for you, the witch hunt? To, targeted you. To, to my doorstep. All right. Um, and did that, if you like, mean that you suddenly thought, gosh, free speech is under, th uh, under threat and I've got to stand up for others who are in this space? Yeah, I, I, it took me completely by surprise, Sean. I, I'd never experienced this before. Ten years ago, um, uh, what I said would be completely uh, unexceptionable, but it suddenly had become unsayable for some people. Yeah. And then I, I realised there was a problem then. Yeah. Well, this is, I think, one of the reasons that you were targeted seven years ago, because you were challenging what in broad terms we would call critical race theory. Yep. And critical race theory is very, very trendy. And believe me, in New Zealand and at the upper levels of our Supreme Court and in our judiciary, it is a very, very trendy notion. And the notion is that colonialism can never be legitimate and that there is intergenerational guilt which must must be recognised and atoned um, if we're ever to make progress as a nation, and that equality before the law actually doesn't exist in post-colonial societies because you have to say that the colonial you know, sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters of colonial people are evil or they have some of that residual evil in them and the poor... Um, <coughs> colonised natives need to get special treatment. Yep. And we are right in the middle of that in New Zealand and have been yep. for quite some time. Is that a phenomenon that's happening around the world? Uh, yes, it is. Um, uh, certainly the notion that that um, the British Empire and its 400-year-old history was nothing but a record of racism, exploitation and oppression. So, so the phrase colonialism and slavery is used as if they were identical, whereas in fact I know and you know that the British Empire was among the first... <laughs> States in the world's history. The Royal Navy was yeah. the tool by which the slave trade was, you know, yeah, so deconstructed. It, it, it was suppressed from Brazil, uh, uh, across Africa, Middle East, Australia to New Zealand. Um, so in the second half of its life, the British Empire was anti-slavery. Uh, also, we would note that in New Zealand, our, uh, well, we'd call them indigenous people, um, Maori uh, practiced slavery um, themselves. Yes, indeed. You know, um, much more so uh, than the British colonisers. Obviously, those views, and, and I would say a realistic assessment in a real context of colonialism and history, and we cannot change history. We can only look back and learn from it. Um, that has obviously, obviously led to you being targeted and the attempted cancellation. Have things got any better in the last seven years or not? Oh, it, 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 well, the, the war's not over, Sean. There's a lot of fight to be had yet, but uh, the landscape is immeasurably better in the last four years, um, but mainly because uh, isolated people like me suddenly found that we have allies and friends and supporters, 
and together we have built institutions and we've, part, we've helped to pass laws. Mm. Uh, the Free Speech Union, was this the first Free Speech Union and you now what have this kind of coalition, uh, coalition of Free Speech Unions around the world? You're a global that, organisation. That's right. I, I ran a conference in Oxford in, in May 19 on what to do about the threat to academic freedom in universities and a bunch of us met afterwards in London. One of them was Toby Young, who mm. was here earlier, and in, in late, uh, I think early February, Tony launched the first ever Free Speech Union UK and since then, um, we've spawned uh, allied organisations in New Zealand, in Australia, uh, in South Africa, I believe most recently Switzerland, and we hope to do so in Canada. Mm. Um, let's talk about what your critics say about groups like yours. And I want to give you the chance to respond to that. And I'm going to make this observation. People on a lot of these issues, which the platform is all about, we were born in some ways of cancellation of people in mainstream media, myself included. Um, but I would look at free speech unions and those involved in these issues, and, and I'm going to say this, and, and I was unsurprised in, in looking into your background, there seems to be a Christian or a religious bent to many of the people involved in these issues. Okay, uh, th that's an interesting, interesting observation, Sean. Uh, uh, I mean, I think I'm a Christian, I'm a professional Christian, I'm a, I'm a clergyman, among other things, and uh, I, I just assume that the, the truth is something we're all seeking for, and the truth uh, as a whole eludes us, so together we need to be a bit humble mm. uh, in listening to each other because we might learn mm. and we need correction. Is there a conservative Christian aspect to the free speech movement? what I'm asking you. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I have no idea what Toby's religious views are, and he's been yep. the leader. All right, okay. Are you, and this is going to get thrown at you, I just guarantee by the mad news media of New Zealand, are you funded by the Atlas Group, or have you ever heard of the Atlas Group? Never heard of them. Sean. Fantastic. I'm <laughs> happy to hear that. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's a common tactic over the other side. I mean, I heard someone in Ireland was, t was telling the world that I was funded by Breitbart. I, yeah. I, I never heard of Breitbart. All right. Who are you funded by? Who's paying for this this movement? Oh, uh, the basic thing, uh, uh, Sean, is we have we now have twenty thousand subscribing members, which gives us, I think, an annual income. Forgive me, I've not been in New Zealand more than twelve hours, but no. it gives us an annual income of about a million quid, so two million Australian, probably around two million uh, um, New Zealand dollars per annum. Yeah. And in addition to that, we have some very uh, concerned and generous donors, yeah. so considerable money. All right. But, um, but not just one funder, a whole lot of them. Yeah. We've made some progress in New Zealand. A change of government has led to the defunding of uh, groups that I'll name, one of them called the Disinformation Project, which was a group of Marxist am academics who were funded through our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern's office uh, very generously to produce, and they would produce supposed academic data or surveys of where online hate was and what was happening on 4chan. And they always told us as journalists, this is so disturbing, this information, we can't actually give you the data for you to analyse. <laughs> but our mainstream media had experts who were prepared to tell them that New Zealand was awash with Nazis and white supremacists. And we even got to the stage where there was a conference, I think three years ago, where the head of our security intelligence service and the prime minister and the head of this disinformation project told us that you had to watch carefully your family members. If they were going on a site called Pinterest, if they were interested in baking, knitting, if they braided their kids' hair, and if their kids had ginger hair, they could possibly be white supremacists. <laughs> and this was swallowed hook, line and sinker by our major television, radio and media outlets. Um, it was literally madness. Uh, but at that stage, it was very hard to argue against. Uh, I'm happy to say those groups and groups like them have now been defunded. Um, and the plans we had for hate speech laws, which would have been incredibly uh, restrictive on freedom of speech, seem to be, seem to be in abeyance. Sean, Sean can I just say that the, the idea that uh, New Zealand and Australia and Britain are, are riven with white supremacism and racism is completely contrary to the empirical evidence. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, w World Values Survey 2023 shows that uh, the likes of Britain, Australia, Canada, I'm afraid New Zealand is not mentioned, but, but all of the, um, these parts of the, the former British Empire 
are among the least racist in the world, yeah. much less racist than, than China or Russia or Iran. Well, the best information I can get from my sources is that at any given time in New Zealand, there are 750 people in New Zealand who might be part of organisations that you would broadly describe as Nazi, racist, neo-Nazi, white supremacist. It's, 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 it's a niche uh, sport. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But to have the head of our security intelligence service telling citizens literally to spy on their family members and be careful if they were braiding their kids here was, was <laughs> bizarre. Uh, uh, scary.